but I do want to, I want us to launch into this year with a word that I heard uh, this week. If you watch my Front Porch Friends, you've, you've heard this word this week because I shared it Wednesday night. But I don't know how many of you actually watched the porch. But uh, if you did, you can hear it again because you need to. I need to hear it again. In fact, I was going to just put up a mirror. I have one in my purse. I started just to put a mirror up right here while I preached tonight and just let me preach to myself because I, I needed this word as much as anybody. And the Lord gave it to me, but it was a corporate word for all of us, okay? And, um, you know, it was interesting, just the atmosphere really of the world, but also of our nation, but even, even within our ramp family after the conference, it was like, you know, you could just sense something, the enemy trying to, to sap, the, to, to take the, the joy, the, the conference. It was just like glory invasion. And then we, we got home this week, and several people just got hit with different things. And I thought, no, devil. No, no, I'm not going to do this. And then I just began to realize uh, a little tactic he was using. And the word says, we are not ignorant of his devices. It's going to be just a little reminder about who we are and what God wants for us tonight. You with me? I was driving home from the conference. I was passing through Chattanooga with mom on the phone. And I was talking with her about a situation I was a little flustered about. And I was saying to mom, you know, what do I, what, I just don't know what I should even do about this. So it's just... But what do you think, Mom? And I was just going, casting some care on my mom. And I said, what do you think? I just need to know how to think right now about all of this. And, and Mom said, well, you know, Karen, she said, I just do it like this. When I'm in, in these situations, she said, I just ask the Lord first. Now, God, how do you want me to handle this? What do you want me to do about this? She said, if I don't hear God right quick, she said, I just think to myself, how does the devil want me to handle this? And then I just do the opposite of whatever he wants me to do. She said, so that, and when she said that, it just went through my spirit. First of all, I just say, God, how do you want me to handle this? And, and, and he'll eventually speak, but if I don't hear him as quickly as I might need to, just stop and say, well, how, what does the devil want me to do? Well, then that's exactly what I'm not going to do. In other words, the devil wants you worried. The devil just wants you to just be filled with despair. He wants that. That's what he wants. The devil wants us to be sitting and just watching the news right now and let him just fill our minds with fear and hopelessness, that the world is just never going to change, that your family's never going to change, that your situation's never going to change. He just wants you filled with hopelessness. That's what the devil wants. That's right. Yep. That's right, Reese. Amen. He wants that, so that's exactly what we're not going to do. The devil wants that because if he can get you in depression, he wants you depressed. I've never seen anything like even in our nation right now. It's like it, it is in the, in the natural realm you see it. It's like somewhat of a heaviness, a depression. It's like this, and it's in the spirit realm. Have you noticed? The devil wants you depressed because when you are depressed, it affects your whole life. You're immobilized. You don't want to do anything. You don't really want to clean your house. You don't want to fix up. You don't want to hang around people. You don't want to be with people. You don't even want to take a bath. You just want to, you just want to crawl in a hole. You just, and that, that is exactly the way the devil wants you to be. The devil just loves depression because he has power there. The devil wants your joy. That's what he's after. And I'll tell you why he's after your joy. It's because Nehemiah 18, 8, 10 says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. That's why Satan wants your joy. Because your strength lies in your joy. This week I was heard a little something Jerry Savelle said, and it caught my attention. Listen to it. He said, here's why the devil wants your joy. Because 
If you lose your joy, you lose your strength. If you lose your strength, you're weak. If you're weak, you can't resist the devil. If you can't resist the devil, he's not going to flee. And if he does not flee, you're not going to have victory. Listen to that. I can say it again if I need to. Think I will. If the devil gets your strength, he gets, if he gets your, his, your joy, he gets your strength. If you don't have strength, then you're weak. If you're weak, you can't resist the devil. If you can't resist the devil, he's not going to flee. If he doesn't flee, you're not going to have victory. So your victory is directly connected to your joy. That's why you got to fight to have your joy. you got to fight to possess your joy. See, the thing is, joy is not something you can go out and just buy in the store. I mean, it's easy to talk about having joy, but it's like, well, I want joy. I don't want to not have joy. I want everybody wants joy, but how do you get joy? You can't just, I, you'd be nice if you could buy it at Walmart, but it ain't for sale. And joy is not something we have when everything is going right in our life. You don't have to wait to have joy when everything is all perfect and the stuff that's not right gets all right. It's, joy is not contingent on our circumstances. Do you know that? I know this is very simple tonight, but we need to be reminded of it. The source of my joy is not found in right circumstances. The source of my joy is found in a person. In somebody that stays all the time. See, if, my, if the source of my joy is found in circumstances, that's when my joy comes and goes because my circumstances are up and down and good and bad. If I put the source of my joy in a natural human being, then it could be iffy because people come and people go. But when your joy and the source of your joy is found in Jesus alone, you can know that's why he said, I'm going to give you something it will never be taken. Why? Because he's never going to leave. He's never going to abandon you. He's never going to change. He alone is the source of my joy. So if I can't buy it, how do I get it? In John 15, he tells you. Say, I'm listening. John 15 says this. Remain in me. John 15, 4. In King James, it says, abide in me. Say, abide. abide. Jesus said, remain in me, and I remain in you. Or abide in me and I will abide in you. He says, those who remain in me, in the middle of verse 5, those who remain or abide in me, and I in them, will produce much fruit. He goes on down. Let me skip on down. Verse 9, I've loved you even as the Father has loved me. Now remain in my love. Y'all, that's huge. <laughs> Did you notice what he just said? I love you as much as the Father loves me. I love you as much as God loves me. Now remain in my love. Abide right there. Stay in it. Don't come and go from it. He says, when you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. Just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. Now watch this. I told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. So Jesus said, the reason I'm telling you to abide in me is so you'll have joy. That's what he said. He said, I'm telling you to abide in me because that's the source of your joy. If you'll stay in me, you'll stay in joy. You hear that? Well, how do you abide somewhere? You just stay there. It's very intentional. If I'm going to abide in my house, it's going to be because I'm going to drive home intentionally and I'm going to abide there tonight. That's how you are with God. How do you abide in him? I spend time with him. I obey his word. We have joy by receiving it by faith. It is a gift from our Father. In other words, how do I have joy? <clears throat> I'll tell you. You will have joy, again, not because everything's right in your life, you have joy by the decision you make to have joy. I choose joy. 
Don't always have to just feel it. Everything don't have to be perfect. In fact, things can be a mess, and I don't feel nothing. But I say, I choose joy. I choose joy. It is a decision I've made to receive something my Father has given me. It's the same way we receive salvation. Salvation comes when we make a decision to receive something God says he has given us. Are you with me? He has given us righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.12 says, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Now, I've got to make a decision to believe that and declare, not because I can earn it, because I can never be good enough for it. No, just because through Jesus, he says, I'm righteous because I believe in Jesus Christ as the Lord of my life. So therefore, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Come on, that's the decision. I make to believe that I am righteous. Same thing for peace. He's given me righteousness. He has given me peace. I love that because I believe it's in what? John 14. He says, my peace I give to you. This is just some of the stuff he's given us. He, he, could you catch that? He said, my peace I'm giving you. He had peace. He has peace. He is peace. He says, it's my peace and I can give it to who I want to, basically. It's my peace. I'm giving you my peace. He says, you can't get it from the world. It's my peace. The world don't even know what, he don't even fathom it. The world tries to find it. They don't have peace. I am peace. I have peace. I'm giving you my peace. My peace I give to you. So how do you receive peace? I make a decision to accept what he has given me. I don't have peace because of everything right. I have peace because I've made a decision to have peace. It's by faith. Anything you ever receive from God is by faith. Come on, people. Everything you ever receive from God is by faith. Yes, I choose to believe that. He has given me righteousness. He has given me peace. I'll tell you another way you receive peace. Jesus said it's all connected to obedience to his word. So that's why Philippians 4 says this. So, here's another way you can have peace. Be anxious for nothing. World out there, COVID scared and politically scared and everything else scared, be anxious for nothing. But in all things with prayer and supplication. Let your request be made known unto God. Watch. And then the peace of God that passes all understanding will keep your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Whoa, that is so powerful. I feel the Holy Ghost on that. How do I have peace? I receive it because God says he gave it to me and I pray. Yep. That's how I, in, in, in the uh, New Living, it says, I love this, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank you for what he's done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard. I love the word. His peace will guard. I love just seeing a guard right there, all dressed up like a guard in his military outfit. Peace is guarding my mind. Peace is guarding my heart. Why? Because I pray. I'm not anxious. I'm not worried about the world and the mess is falling apart. I pray and I look to God and I pour out my complaint. Then I just rest in him and I have peace in him. Hallelujah. Then he says here, so now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thought, he said. Then he says, fix your thoughts. How do you have peace? How do you have joy? I'm going to tell you. Fix your thoughts. In other words, when you say fix them, it means you set your thoughts. Come on. You charge your mind. You fix it. You target it. You, you adjust it to you tell your thoughts what they're going to think. You fix your thoughts. You don't let your mind just wonder about whatever your mind wants to want. No, you tell your thoughts what they're going to think. You fix your thoughts on what is pure and true and honorable and right, pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. 
Look at this in the Passion Translation. Brad, throw that up there for me. Be cheerful with joyous celebration in every season of life. Hey, y'all, that's a commandment. Do y'all believe the Bible was inspired by the Holy Ghost? Then the Holy Ghost isn't asking you to do this if you don't mind. This is a command. Is he telling this is what this is what we're supposed to be doing? Be cheerful and with joyful celebration in every season of life. Let joy overflow for you are united with united with the anointed one. <laughs> Let gentleness be seen in every relationship for our Lord is ever near. Moving on. Don't, I love this. Don't be pulled in different directions or worried about a thing. Be saturated in prayer throughout how many times? Each day. Move. Offering your faith-filled request before God with overflowing out of gratitude. Tell him every, watch, tell him every detail of your life. Moving on. Then, God's wonderful peace that transcends human understanding will make the answers known to you through Jesus Christ. So, keep your thoughts continually fixed on all that is authentic and real, honorable and admirable, beautiful and respectful, pure and holy, merciful and kind, and fasten your thoughts on every glorious work of God, praising him always. Give God praise for that. I'm almost finished. That doesn't sound like the news. That doesn't sound like social media. Does it? No, it doesn't sound like your social media account. Pure, holy, praiseworthy, lovely, beautiful, kind. Does that? No. No wonder people are battling with such depression. Filling our minds with that garbage. He's given you righteousness. He's given you peace. And he's given you joy that John 16 says no man can take from you. So these, the, these three things, the righteousness, the peace, and the joy. What is that? What's the atmosphere? What is that the attributes of? The kingdom of God. So he's given us these things. What does that mean? He's given us the kingdom of God in a messed up world inside of you. You're carriers of the kingdom, and our world needs joy. Our world needs righteousness. Our world needs peace. Our world needs joy. That's why you're sitting and breathing in this earth today. You want to know your purpose? Your purpose is you're a carrier of the kingdom of God. That's why you're breathing. Come on, you don't have to wonder, oh, am I going to go to the mission field? Am I going to be something major? Am I going to do something huge for God? Just carry the kingdom of God. That's why. That's why you're here. That's your purpose. You don't have to have a microphone to do that. Your office needs the kingdom. Your office, your schoolroom needs peace. Your family needs joy. Everywhere, Walmart needs the light of God doesn't mean you have to go around just laughing and giddy all the time to be a carrier of joy. Jesus taught us that. Jesus, who was the epitome of joy, Jesus, who was walking joy, Jesus would have been the most fun person in the world to hang around with. He was joy all the time, George. Can you imagine? I'd love to have heard Jesus just laughing. He's laughing till he couldn't hardly catch his breath. I bet those disciples had some times under some trees talking when they were laughing, laying on the ground. You know it. They were hanging around with joy. But even though he was filled with joy, Jesus, he was never disconnected from the pain of people. Nor was he disconnected from his own pain. He wept 
over a city. He wept when his friend died and the people he loved were hurting. But there was never a time he was without joy because there was never a time he wasn't abiding in his father or doing what his father wanted. So there was never a moment Jesus was without joy. It's true. Even on the cross and even in Gethsemane. Jesus knew that real joy supersedes the circumstances of this world. Real joy can just get above. How do I know Jesus was like that? Hebrews 12 tells us. Hebrews 12 tells us how Jesus kept his joy in a place of pain. It says that for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Are you with me still, please? Jesus said for the joy set before him, he endures the pain. Teaching us to set our gaze on what will be on the days that we're hurting. You set the promise before you like Jesus did. When Jesus was on the cross in the most unspeakable, in, in more pain than any human has ever known, physically, mentally, and spiritually, he carried the weight of the world. No human that's ever lived has known pain like he knew on that cross because it was transcended a human experience. It was the spiritual battle of the ages, and yet he did not lose sight of his joy. In the middle of his pain, he put his joy before him. So when he was hurting, he kept his eye on his joy. And what was his joy? He knew that the process I'm in right now of this pain is necessary in order for me to obtain the joy that my father is showing me. As I go through this pain, it means if I can hold on, I can, I've got it before me, I'm going to save the world. Come on. Come on. That's the joy before me. I'm going to deliver John. I'm going to set free Sophia. Come on. I'm going to deliver Monica. Come on. If I can hold on through this pain right here, her face is before me. I'm looking at his face. I'm going to save the world because the process of this pain is necessary for me to obtain the joy. And the Bible says, for the joy that was set before him, that joy gave him the strength he needed to endure the pain that was necessary for him to obtain the promise. Hold on, my. Teaching us in the days of our pain, we set the promise before us. That's what I'm going to do. Having joy and abiding in joy doesn't mean you don't hurt. It just means that in my pain, I'm going to keep the joy before me. And that joy is going to give me the strength. I remember when Lindsay was gone. I refer to that all the time. And I'll refer to it through eternity. When you see me in heaven, I'll probably still be talking about it. Hallelujah. Walking with Martha, talking about lazy, raising Lazarus from the dead. And I'm going to say, let me tell you about my daughter too. Martha, I'm going to tell you about Martha. Come on. I'm going to talk about it forever. Because I saw God do a miracle and I'll never get over it. Hallelujah. I'll never get over it. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Pam Barnett and Lee knows this, but when she was gone, I took pictures. I've still got them in my house right now in a special place. I would put pictures of her and Casey married. And I stared at them constantly. I prayed with them. I looked at them. I kept them in my Bible all the time. I kept them in my Bible and slept with them. Come on, I put pictures. I'd put pictures of Lauren and Lindsay together. I'd put her pictures of all kinds of pictures of her back with the family. I would just put pictures of it up all the time. Why? Because it was a joy set before me. I knew right now I'm in pain, but I'm going to keep joy right here because I know this pain right now is going to work a process that's going to give me the faith and the strength to endure what I am right now because someday, someday I'm going to have that joy. Someday this pain is going to turn to what I see. Come on, that's what you're going to do today. Tonight, you got to take what you're believing for. The son you're believing to be delivered. The parent you're believing to be free. Come on, whatever it is, the healing you're believing for, the restored marriage, whatever it looks like, set it before you done. Set it before you completely fulfilled. Set that joy before you manifested. And receive from it the strength you need. 
to endure the process. Stand all over the room. Thank you, Jesus.